getting directly Brother Bram pronounced her well, and she took another picture, and this was gone. Right. As soon as he pronounced her well. My wife had a nervous breakdown several years ago, and Brother Branham had us. We went over to Brother Woods' house, and I thought Brother Branham was in Africa. And uh, Brother Woods, when we got to his house, Brother Woods said, uh, Little Prophet's home, said, told him. I said, No, I can't do that. I said, I just can't do it. He said, oh, go on, call him. I said, he's up there. I said, no, I can't do that. Brother. I never would. I just can't do it. So it wasn't five minutes till the phone rang. Brother Brown said, Brother Wood said, who's down there? <laughs> he said, you reckon they'd mind if I come down? That's the way it would work. You know, you didn't have to push yourself towards him. It, it would, it, it's just like the Lord Jesus when he said, I have need. To go by when they went to buy the vittles, and he told him he had need to go up there, and that woman was there at the well. And ordinary person would have looked at that, and he thought, "Well, sure, because he all know who he's talking to." That when that's the way it works. It's so simple, so simple. He came down, and my wife sat right on the couch, just like this, and he sat in the floor, right there in the floor. Told her what to do. And what the problem was, that ended it right there. Nice. He called me out one time out of all the years that I followed him. I followed him <clears> to <throat> Chicago. And a while ago, I started to tell you all this about being in Chicago for the meeting. You were there. And I'll have to tell you how that he did that. I had worked on this car and had, you know, I never would let him paint me for it. He, uh, this doctrine was going so strong at that time, uh, saying that Brother Branham was the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I could never accept that. I just knew, you know, I thought he's the nearest thing to Jesus Christ I ever saw. You know, he's a man that can make the Scripture live. And he's a man that God is pleased to come down and manifest himself in and prove to the world that he's still alive. And I said, he, he eats and drinks and sleeps. And, and uh, you know, he comes right down to my house. And But little did I know that we were promised that in a form and to realize that we was to have a Messiah exactly the way they had it back there in the early days. I didn't realize that at the time, see. Because I had followed his first pull. I saw that in manifestation where he'd take the person to the hand and the little sensation, little knots would come up on his hand there. And when he came out of that cave, they told him, said, the angel of the Lord told him, said, you take them and do that, and if that leaves, pronounce them well. And if they don't, just pronounce a blessing on them and send them on their way. I stand, I've been as close to him as almost I in view and seen that take place over his, on the back of his hand. And then it went from that on into another phase of uh, he could just sit here a little bit and it wouldn't be a thing in the world. Nobody in here in this room could hide from him. Even from the time you was a little boy, he could tell you something you said or done when you was a little boy. You think, my word, how could that ever be? How could, you know? So I saw that, and then I watched it real close, and that really, really stirred me up to think it. Uh, when he walked down there in the woods, and he said, "Let there be," and a squirrel come out there on a limb, I thought, "That's beyond a man. How could a man ever do a thing like that?" But yet you couldn't say that to some people because they'd say, no, now you're making Brother Branham the Lord Jesus. But I never did do that because he told me later that I didn't. That they would say, some would say that was Brother Branham. He did that. That was him doing that. And I'd say, no, that, that's, that's not scripture. That's not supposed to come that way. I couldn't see it like that. So in Chicago, he's having this meeting and 
uh, is in the Lane Tech Auditorium there. And, and this doctrine was really going strong. It really bothered me. Hey, I just couldn't find it. It just, you know how you see something that you know and feel in your heart it's 100% wrong, you just hands off. You don't want to have anything to do with it. And I thought, how could people not see that and realize what's happening? So I told Brother Woods, I said, Brother Woods, I'm going to have to confess at this meeting, if that was, if that would be true, then I've already spoke against it. And you know, there's only one unpardonable sin, and that's the blatant sin of the Holy Ghost, too. And uh, I said, but I cannot say that Brother Random is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I said, when, when the Lord was talking to the disciples, he looked at them and he said, you call me Master and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. And I said, uh, Brother Brennan won't say that. I said, that can't be. And I said, uh, I, I will never, I'll leave this meeting and I'll never say that Brother Brennan is the Lord Jesus, although I see something happening in this ministry that I can't explain. I don't, I don't have words to explain. So, Long that afternoon, Billy Paul came to me and he said, Dad said, tell you he's coming to see you when he got home. So I was kind of hurt to go home. <laughs> well, I went home and he came over and I, Brother Collins and I was pretty close and uh, I used to have a service station and I sold a service station to him and, and was kind of helping him some. And I, I just told my wife, I said, I'm going on over to the service station today, and Brother Brandon and Brother Woods comes. You just tell them to come on over to the station. I live about five or six miles from the station, probably. And so I went on over to the station, and in the morning got over there until I looked, and here come Brother Brandon and Brother Woods driving up in the Cadillac. One of Brother Brett gave me. And you know, I would just get numb when I'd see him coming. You know, you just, you couldn't even have an evil thought when you're surrounded by it. Just, it was just there. So I kind of think I know how the disciples felt when they, when Jesus came mm -hmm. back. That was the same spirit, see. Mm -hmm. And it, you think, well, I'm going to ask him a lot of things, and I'm going to find out that you wouldn't ask him nothing. <laughs> you just, you was without words. You just couldn't do it. So he came up and parked and, and, uh, Brother Collins, he pulled in like this. Third station was out in this direction here. And he parked and he told Brother Woods to get out and come over and tell me to come and get in the car with him. Brother Collins had a trailer he lived in uh, over on this side in a little lot. And so I went over and opened the door and got in and he, the power windows, he pushed a button and rolled up the windows. and He said, uh, now I'm going to pay you for working on that car. And I said, Brother Bram, I, I can't let you do that. I said, do you remember that woman in the Bible that came and put in her few pennies that she had? He said, yeah. I said, I probably, if I'd have been there, I probably wouldn't let her do that. I said, yeah, but that would have kind of knocked her out of a blessing. I said, she came to be blessed. And I said, that was all she had, and that would have... He stopped her from doing it and knocked her out of a blessing. And I said, if you pay me for working on that car, I said, you'll knock me out of a blessing. So he just took his checkbook like this and pitched it up on the dash. And, and Brother Collins' little trailer, house trailer, he said, no, they had a window in the back door about the size of a plate that you'd eat out of, round window. And he said, uh, you see that window over there in that door? And I said, yes, sir. And I was done boohooing then. I didn't know. I didn't know what was going to happen. I was just so scared, you know. And it was a reverent fear. I wasn't afraid he was going to hurt me or anything mm -hmm. like that. It was just a real reverent fear. He said, "I'm going to punch you right in the center of that window." He said, uh, "I see you standing in a certain place, listening to a group of men talking, and one man with his hair hanging down on the side of his face." I knew exactly then what he was going to say. 
because three days before that I was standing listening to those men talking and he was just a preaching like this, you know. His hair had fell down on the side of his face. And he said, now let me tell you, he said, that spirit never was on you. He said, it haunted you. In other words, it really hit me hard. You know? I couldn't accept what they were saying. And he called that, it haunted me. He said, now I want to tell you something. He said, if, if you make me any other thing and your brother a sinner save of grace, you make me an antichrist. He said, I want a people that'll follow me up to a place and someday I'm going to, he pointed his finger up through the windshield just like that, he said, someday I'm going to say, there he is, exactly the way I told you. He done his hands like this. He held out his hand. He said, here you are, and here I am, and here's God. He said, now don't ever try to come up here. He said, this right here is one thread better than sanity. That was him. That's where a prophet treads. And ain't no human being, ordinary man, can tread where he goes. He'd blow his mind. He said, now if... I happen to go from here up to here, then you might come up here where I was. And I believe in my heart the true bride is fixing to make that step. See, he'll make a step back this way, we'll make a step this way, then he'll point us to him. It's like the city would do. And he said, uh, be sure I say this right. It's been so long, it's almost, sometimes I have a little problem remembering, but I'll tell it the best that I can remember. But he said, uh, I'm going to tell you something that don't nobody know, not even my wife. And he said, don't you tell it until you see it happen. And then you can tell it. But he said, I'm leaving you for good. And that was in 64? 62. 62. 62. Late, 62 late 62. I knew that. And see, I had no idea what he was saying. I never caught it. I never caught it at all. Mm -hmm. If he had said to me right there in that car, he said, now prepare yourself. God's going to take me off the scene. I said, Brother Brown, I can't, I just, I, I don't want to hear that. I can't understand that, see? Because I thought he'd stand right here with me, be right here all the time. Anything I needed to know, I asked him. Anything. I never, I didn't fear anything. I didn't fear death. I never feared anything, see? But I can imagine that the disciples felt the same way just before our Lord was taken off the scene. Yes. He become common to them. See what I mean? Yes. See? We don't want it to be. We, we think, well, no, I never let it. But we did let it become a common thing. Because he told us many times, he said, I'll not always be with you. My time is limited. I'm, I'm not, uh, not going to be around much longer. He said that in the different times. You know? And the thing that we don't realize that I didn't realize at the time is you cannot have a prophet on the scene and have judgment at the same time because a prophet when he comes and like you said not when he starts off in his ministry but when he comes and begins to sound the sounding of his ministry so he said now Lord Jesus came and the last three and a half, about the three and a half years of his ministry, he was sounding forth something. In other words, he is saying, he said to the disciples one day, he said, uh, our ministerial group, he said, what would you say if you see the Son of Man ascending back up from whence he came? I thought, what kind of, what was he saying? And then it really came on down to, he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Brother, I said, he never did explain none of that. He just said 
And it's, it's behooving to us to really know the Scriptures because uh, did He fulfill what was written in the Holy Script or didn't He? He did exactly what the Lord Himself did. When I really began to understand and see what was going on, uh, I didn't understand it all at first. He was just a man. He was just a wonderful person. He was a man that I could just stay around all the time. I didn't want to leave him. I wanted to be around him. And I'd have given him my last dollar. But he, that was just a man. But when he really come and began to lay down the Word, then I saw in his ministry a parallel of the ministry of Christ. And when, when he was called over in Houston to deal with those people over there in that meeting and those kids was down there cutting up and carrying on, making love in the meeting. And a lot of people fail to see this. Whatever Brother Brown would have said would have happened to them children. But he didn't do as Elisha did. Elisha, when he was following Elijah, Elijah was going off of the scene, went off of the scene, and those little kids, brethren, said maybe had heard their parents saying, well, he's a, how come he didn't go on up with Elijah? Making fun of him, speaking evil against him. And when them little kids looked at him and said, called him old Bali and said, why didn't you go up like Elijah? Brethren, said that angered that prophet, but God honored what he said. And he said, that wasn't the Spirit of Christ. See, this Malachi 4 messenger was to turn us back and to manifest the Jesus Christ to the letter again. And that's why that they wanted to worship Him. Because He said it. Brother Brown said, This seventh church age messenger will be mistaken for the Lord Jesus. He said it. See? And it's, it's no problem to me to sit and say, Well, I don't understand why then people had to do that. They were supposed to do that. This is one thing I forgot in this vision he was having there in that car. He looked at me and he said, did you know that them people were supposed to do that? I said, no, brother, I didn't. He said, if they had not, I'd have to went back and repent it and said, I'm bringing the wrong message. See? One day he sat down in the road and he drew three little lines like that. Three lines in the gravel. He said, now I have to make it. This guy here, he said, he moves real slow. It takes a lot to move him. This guy over here just goes a whizzing. And he said, I gotta make it just right here, real strong to move this guy. And when I get him to move, and this guy goes on past him. Overdoes it, oversays it, you know. Overemphasizes it, saying, well, that was Jesus. Let's see. It was, for it was not. It's the same thing you could say about Enoch. He was, for he was not, for God took him. I believe that Brother Branham, when I really begin to understand is when he preached in Phoenix. And he preached birth pains. And that priest got up out of his seat, came over and gave him his Bible and told him, said, My son, be steady. Read it out of my book. God's fixing the middle. What did he do? That same scripture that the Lord Jesus read in first portion of it, Isaiah 61, 1 to 2, the Lord Jesus read down halfway and He stopped. Brother Brown read, the, he said, the first part of it pertained to His first coming. And He said, the second part that I read pertained to His second coming, which would bring judgment upon this generation for, for rejecting Messiah's son. So if that was the Messiah sign over there in the early days, then this was the Messiah sign to this generation. It's no different. It's just that two halves and a makes the whole. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, that his ministry uh, couldn't come until this last hour of this dispensation of time. And I, I'm, I'm just so thrilled to think it. I me, mean, a little old Kentucky hillbilly, can be a part of it. 
I asked him to let me out as a, you know, as an officer in the church because I never did it. No time ever feel like I was a deacon or qualified for health or qualifications of a deacon. And I asked him to let me out, and he said no. He said the Lord put you in here, and said you stay till He took you. And, you know, well, it's not. It's not. I don't feel worthy to ever be called a deacon. How could I be a deacon? I told him one time, I said, Brother I'm not even spiritual. I don't know that spiritual place. How could I be a deacon? And he called that the church of the living God. The living God. Oh, it was just wonderful to think how he could come and sit. My daddy passed away in 1957. We was real close. Always, I was the kind of the black sheep of the family, and when I was growing up, and you know, I, you go through those avenues, you know, you think, well, you know everything, you don't know nothing. But I wasn't interested in the spiritual things. But later on, I began to something really got a hold of me, and I couldn't get away from it. And he knew I loved my daddy. My daddy had a falling out with a feller lived in back of him up on the hill on a farm. And the feller just fell out with daddy or something or what. And my brother and dad went a fishing up in a little lake above where his farm was at there. And my brother caught a 24 pound catfish on a little hook that wasn't over that long, a brim hook. And they wrestled with that fish for I don't know how long to catch him. Finally got him and cleaned him and everything. Daddy took some of that fish up and gave it to that old fellow up there. And that mended their friendship. And Brother Brown said that was the reason for the catch of that fish. To mend that friendship. So we don't think about things <laughs> like this. It's just things that the way it comes is just simple. God has his way of doing things. Uh -huh. I guess one of the most little insignificant things I ever heard Brother Ben tell, and I never forgot it because it means so much to me. He said one day he went down on the creek and he was fishing, sitting there, and just kind of relaxing and fishing. So throw the pole, the hook and things out in the water. He said, uh, all of a sudden he said he seen a little old bug come flying down there and fell down in the water with the buzzing around, 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 you know. Said he looked down at him and he said, Well, little feller, said, I guess you've uh, about shot your wad. You won't be around much longer. That's about the end of it. Said directly he looked at him, here come a leaf. Curled around, 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 around like that. And kind of that's a little bug climbed up on there and dried his wings and flew away. God makes a way. <laughs> and he'd notice all those things. So he never missed anything. All of that and that was such a little insignificant thing that he could he would pick up things like that. But it's, uh, you know, really people don't realize, a lot of people don't realize what a prophet, what a prophet represents. But he said that a prophet represents oncoming judgment. See, I've got quotes that I want all the way back to 1958. Brother Brown told how that God was appearing 1958 and he was showing mercy then like he did to Abraham just before the destruction and he said now the next time and he said it's been laughed at and scoffed at and made fun of but he said the next time you see him manifest himself he'll be in judgment on a nation and has turned his back on God that's what you're seeing today Every nation under heaven's in trouble. This we talk about a democracy. We don't have a democracy. Look what's happening in every nation. Every nation's broke. Remember that they're spending money should be spent forty years from now trying to pay taxes and keep this thing afloat. And and they're kidding the people, trying to make them believe that it's a false economy. Everything is false. They won't tell you the That's truth. Right. They won't. And what it is, it's judgment sent upon this nation. Mm -hmm. She's under severe guilt.